that I was the uh, founder of Run For Your Life, Zombie Run. Trading of digital assets is a form of communication and social. It's a form of interaction. Uh, being a digital native, a digital nomad, you know, you don't have a regular pay sleep. They are legit people, right? This is legit income from working, but they couldn't get a credit card. They're traveling around. They don't have a, a solid proof of address, so they couldn't, you know, complete their KYC. Having cryptocurrency, having the blockchain, or right, has a store of value, has a form of tokenization. Able to connect all these brands and resources together will be able to help a lot of people in the world. Uh, we want to build an economy that empower people to be able to work and live freely anywhere in the world. It is, it is still a very optimistic future, for sure. So it's not going to zero. If it's not going to zero, then where is it going to be? Super exciting. That's a, that's a future I want to be a part of for sure. Hello and welcome to today's episode of Token Talks, brought to you as ever from our studio here in sunny Singapore, where the aircon is always set to high. Today, we'll be discussing the influence of Web3 on brand culture. My name is Sam and I'll be your host for today. Uh, and I'm really excited to welcome on today's guest. Uh, he is a man who is currently CEO of um, Tomorrow Labs, which is a company based here in Singapore, which really supports businesses and brands um, with new ways to adopt frontier technologies. Arthur Lin, welcome to the show. Thank you, Sam. GM, GM, everybody. GM, GM, indeed. Yeah. Uh, so Arthur, yeah. I think let's get started and kick sure. things off. Uh, I would love to hear a little bit more about you, your personal journey into this space and kind of any anecdotes you can share with us. Um, I think at this point of time, uh, I always fall back to, you know, what my track and field coach taught me when I was an athlete in school that is it's all in your mind. Yeah, it's all about the mindset. I think uh, in the space, we are deep in the crypto winter. We are fighting the bears. All right. I think uh, having a very positive uh, mindset is important because these are cycles. We should face it and we should uh, bond ourselves together right? and start from our own mind. Having a positive growth mindset all right, to build things uh, that can last and be progressive. Resilience. Yes. Right. <laughs> Only my uh, yeah, exactly. I think for uh for you know, those of us who have been through more than one cycle now, uh you get used to it. But I can imagine for people who are experiencing a bear market for the first time, it's uh it's quite an unsettling period, right? Um I guess before we talk a little bit more about uh, the building that we're seeing uh, at the moment in this space, uh, can you give us a little bit of background on your uh, kind of, I guess, professional uh, uh, history and experience in, in blockchain, Web3, crypto? Yeah, so um, our company was one of the first few that built a uh, move to earn game. It's called Runner's Planet in uh, this part of the world, Southeast Asia, Singapore. It's called Runner's Planet. Uh, we were going through a tough time. So we did uh, this Runner's Planet because of COVID. And before Runner's Planet, I was the uh, founder of Run For Your Life, Zombie Run. So uh, I took the brand from the US, made it into the franchise, licensed it around the world, had 50 over events globally, over 20 countries. So we built a 1 million uh, strong community around the world, and majority in China. So I spent six years in Shanghai, in China. And then COVID came, everything came to a stop, all right, 2019, end of 2019, uh, we, we postponed and canceled all the events for 2020. All right, we have 20 events lined up, we stopped everything. And uh, me and my co-founder, uh, Taka, Japanese, uh, in Shanghai, we just look at each other, it's like, what should we do next? All right, for the next three months, you know, he's back in Japan, I'm back in Singapore. Every day we turn on the camera. What should we do with the company? What should we do with the business? All right, it's COVID is getting worse and worse. All right, we can't do the event. So uh, we thought about it, and I am a graduate of uh, computer science engineering uh, for my A levels in Singapore. One of the one of the few. I did uh, know some programming, but I hated it. All right, hated it. So I, I still know some like uh, basic architecture, right? Product development. So we we brainstorm and we thought, why not we do something decentralized instead of everyone coming together at one place 10,000 people in a day why not we allow them to do at their own time on the on their own individually 
or in small groups, all right, to uh, uh, comply to the COVID regulations back then, but still have the same, you know, ability to show it on social media, connect with people, and encourage people through the tough times. So that was the purpose of building that. Uh, building a product is tough, right? It took us about two years. We almost spent two million dollars, all right, and uh, almost just left with one month runway. All right, of cash. And then uh, one of the investors that we have pitched before, Heliconia Capital, they have uh, a lot of uh, local brands and company that is a very strategic partner to have. And they told us that, hey, stop, don't go. All right, if you are able to help you know, your own brand, the zombie run, transform all right, with blockchain, with tech, digitalize it, you know, build a community online, can you help other brands in Singapore? or in the region to do that as well. And then you build a Web3 launchpad together. I invest, I give you um, the companies, I give you a long pipeline of companies all right, for business. And I was like, okay, sure, well, let's do that. All right. And then we still can do our Runners Planet later on, which is why we have uh, Giants Planet now. All right. It's a, it's a uh, Giants Planet is uh, uh, adapted from Runners Planet itself. Yeah. So that's how we come about. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. I mean, just for anybody uh, tuning in who's, who's not familiar with with Run for Your Life, so uh, if I'm quickly to summarize, it's it's a a zombie themed uh, fun run, I guess. Fun run. Yep, it is. Where there are you know blood pits and there mm -hmm. are you know zombie related experiences. Everybody is dressed up, and then you guys also move that kind of into a, a Web three space too, with with uh, NFTs as tickets and stuff like that. Is it? We decided, you know to use our best resources to build our digital platform first. Got it. And then the IP can come later, right? With all these NFT tickets and uh, collectibles, you know, and then having that game online built up first. Yeah, yeah awesome. So Cool, and and you have uh, you have quite a big launch coming up uh, with Giants Planet. Uh, do you, would you mind sharing a little bit about that? So sure, yeah, Giants Planet uh, is basically we are building a digital economy, all right? to empower and encourage uh, people around the world to you know, explore the world, live freely. So this digital economy is to uh, serve the digital natives. So we see uh, a lot of uh, growing trend of digital nomads, digital natives. Uh, currently in Southeast Asia, just from uh, Europe and North America, we have already 2.5 million of digital nomads in this part of the world. Uh, that's excluding um, the local Southeast Asians and the people from India and China and other parts of Asia. Adding that up is close to 10 million. And we see that our rising trend with, you know, global political instability, rising cost of living, uh, unemployment rates, right, with the AI replacing jobs. So a lot of fresh graduates actually from China, Chinese uh, economy, they are looking for uh, other opportunities. In fact, a lot of them are already digital nomads or digital native within their uh, China itself. But you know, we want to uh, also tap into that uh, trend of you know uh, being able to travel freely and explore the world. You know, that's what you know we young people love to do uh, when we can. So so running on that to allow them and empower them the ability to have affordable accommodation through community living, like co-living spaces, mm -hmm. to allow them to be able to uh, consume and spend all right, uh, with their digital assets, all right, because there's also a, a key lack of uh, real world value and assets in the Web3 space, as we see. So how do we do that bridge and convert uh, you know, uh, their digital assets all right, to be able to fulfill their basic living needs. And at the same time, on the other side of the, of the house, right, the brands, right, there's a lot of brands, consumer brands, right, they are trying to be more competitive. I think there's a lot of great brands like Lululemon, Nike, they have built a strong brand through community. I still remember when I first spoke with Lululemon 2014 with my zombie run, all right, they are still a very, uh, very niche, all right, underground brand, and you know they just focus on community building. All right, so that I think is the start of brand building. So a lot of brands has seen that uh, over the last decade and starting to jump on the bandwagon to build a community as part of brand building. 
all right, and and uh, their loyalty program, brand engagement. So I think that is something that uh, Web three is super uh, effective in doing that because it gives instant all right ownership, fractional you know, ownership or or tokenized uh, of their tokenization of their assets, and also building that uh, communication channels with tools like Discord, Twitter. All right, you have a lot of like this kind of AMA sessions online to help build brand loyalty and brand engagement. So on the other side of the house, a lot of traditional brands, they want to be competitive. They still want to target the younger audiences, right? the new target audiences. And this is how we can bridge them right? to convert their product and services, digitalize them, right? and bring them to the Web3 space and promote them uh, for consumption by the uh, digital natives. Yeah, yeah and I, it, it's one of the kind of... I guess the evolutions of Web3 or Web3 use cases that I really love because mm. if we roll back a few years when we talk about things like NFTs, it was mostly about the artifact itself and kind of monetization of the NFT, right? Whereas now I think uh, brands, certainly for the past two years, have already been uh, been really committing to mm. using tokenized experiences mm -hmm. to build community and to create kind of sustained engagement. Yes. I guess maybe now we could talk about a few of the examples of that. Uh, you know, I would love to bring up uh, kind of the work that Artifact Studios are doing, and, and it's obviously the the, the the example that everybody turns to, right? But uh, I know, have you seen the the, the thing they've got uh, they've got going with Remova at the moment? The uh, have you come across? Yes, that? yes, yeah. I saw that as well. Very cool because they they they're essentially. Uh, I was very surprised to see Romova go into this because it's such a kind of classic, elegant brand that is, I, I would assume, is very strict in terms of the way that they use the different elements of the brand, right? But uh, the work that they've done with Artifact in in uh, basically enabling people to, there's some kind of a forging experience. Uh, if you become eligible as a result, you can, uh, you can get early access to these unique uh, pieces of luggage, which look super... Web three, you know, they're like mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, pixelated, and um, it, it's yeah, it, it's a really interesting case, I think. But what I can see and what I'd expect to come out of that from from Artifact is that it's not just going to be that one-off thing. That you know, probably once you open the suitcase, there's going to be something else that spawns, and then something else, and then something else. Yeah. What, what are your favorite examples of? Uh, I think recently there is the Tomorrowland NFTs. Mm. So I think it's one of the most successful ones. So. Uh, they raised over $2 million from the NFT sales and everyone is happy with the NFT because they got priority access, uh, early access, they got uh, special locations to uh, enjoy the festival that is you know, attended by hundreds of thousands of people around the world. So, and you know, uh, that is amazing, right? That's a, it's community-based, it's a great event. And uh, they, they want to have some part of it to keep as a collectible, as a part of the memory. So I think that is that is uh, really timeless and it really brings value to the collectors themselves. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I love it. I mean, the, the, the kind of music, concert, festival yeah. use case. Is yeah, and this is exactly the same audience that we are talking about, right? The young, all right, active, adventurous, you know, uh, capable people around the world that have the ability to pay a thousand dollars two thousand dollars for the tickets right be there you know work hard play hard yeah so yeah. i think these are the people remote i think is also one of the key uh is also very aligned because i think they understood their target audience very well all right they are able to spend they are able to travel they have mobility so and they are you know probably very uh, savvy with the digital assets with the digital world so Hence, they have that as a collection. So uh, I, I think that is very in line. They were also a partner of one of our uh, clients, partner, uh, One Championship. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So so they, I think they sponsored One Championship before. I think, you know, it's a very similar kind of target audience. Yeah. Looking at. yeah. yeah interesting you bring up that example. I feel like uh, there is this kind of like um, meeting point or inflection point between kind of sports, art and Web3 which is just kind of right in the sweet spot for the target mm -hmm. audience at the moment, right? Whether it be, yeah. So I think that is the future of lifestyle, mm. future of work and future of lifestyle, all mm. right? With AI, with gaming industry, um, I think in order to be able to be competitive and to be able to be sustainable, to have a sustainable lifestyle, we need to be more effective in generating income and value. 
to society. All right, if you are able to adapt and take on these tools and learn, then you will be in control and you have confidence and then you have freedom. All right, so financial freedom and to have a uh, ability to to have a lifestyle that you desire. So I think that is the future of the lifestyle, future of work. And you see that you know when you have more time, all right, when you're more effective in generating your income, all right, or you're able to work anywhere, you have more flexibility and freedom to have the kind of uh, lifestyle which is sports, music, arts, entertainment, gaming. All right, so so I think these are. Uh, the future trends of uh, lifestyle and and work. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I, I think we we see this in exactly the same way. You know, that cryptocurrency uh, is is less about like a number on your on your balance, right? It's more about um, something we talk about a lot here. It's kind of earning lifestyle credits, right? And then being able to use those lifestyle credits in in different yeah. ways, no matter which part of kind of what age you are, what demographic you belong to. Uh, it's more about it's more about that, I think, that ultimately brings us kind of satisfaction. Yeah, yeah exactly. I think it's going back to the roots, the fundamentals of like butter trade, right? So, you know, you have something, but now it's now in the digital form that you can exchange, all right, the value. And uh, yeah, I think right now about over 2 billion people, 2.5 billion people are still they still lack, you know, uh, basic banking services infrastructure in many parts of the world. All right, especially the developing ones. All right, and and even in the developed countries, because uh, being a digital native, a digital nomad, you know, you don't have a regular pay slip. You don't have a regular proof of residence. All right, I'm doing KYC for for some of my investors. They are top tier investors. But they're traveling around. They don't have a you know a, a solid proof of address, so they couldn't you know complete their KYC you know process easily. All right, and and more so for the masses of digital workers around the world. All right, project workers, Web three project workers. They are legit people. All right, this is legit. All right, uh, income from working, but they couldn't get a credit card or get a loan because of uh, their digital kind of uh, work. So, so I think uh, having cryptocurrency, having the blockchain, or right, has a store of value, has a form of tokenization, uh, able to connect all these brands and resources together, will be able to help a lot of people in the world. Mm. Yeah, mm. yeah, and particularly um, here in Southeast Asia, all right, which I know is a big focus, obviously, for for you guys at, at Tomorrow Labs. Uh, you know, if you look at uh, crypto adoption uh, numbers in countries like Vietnam and you know a few other markets in the region it's it's just soaring right and be because of legitimate real world use cases where people need access exactly. to basic financial services exactly. yeah and and incidentally for our community at Giants Planet, I just saw today we had 37% from Indonesia wow yeah 5% from Singapore about 4 to 5% from Singapore 4 to 5% from Vietnam so that is close to you know half of our entire uh, community, which is 24,000 24, strong. And that was all built up within the span of three to four months. Yeah, yeah, amazing. Yeah. So I'd be interested to get your take on, on, on China as well. Um, uh, actually, let me come at that question from a different angle. So uh, I, I lived in Hong Kong and relocated to Singapore earlier this year, and I attended Token 2049 uh, last year. And it made a real lasting impression on me, even though it's the first one kind of post COVID or it's still during COVID, about the kind of level of innovation and amount of building that was happening in this part of the world, right? Versus when you go to a, an event in Europe or the States, you know, I think the diversity we have here and the stuff that's happening is just, is just amazing. Um, you've spent a lot of time in China. Uh, is that the case there? And kind of what do you see coming out of, of China in, in the Web3 space? Definitely there is FOMO. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right, because that's the same thing that uh, when I first brought the zombie run from the US uh, to Asia, All right, it became viral. And I brought it to Hong Kong. It was a sold out event, 13,000 people. And then in China, it's all sold out event. All right, so that was a huge jackpot because this part of the world in Asia back in 2012 and 13, People could see on social media, could see on media that, wow, there's something fun. And, you know, the Americans are having fun. The Europeans are having fun. Why are we not having fun with this? All right. And 
10 years ago, a huge social credit is Instagram, your Instagram lights. All right. So when Instagram was just starting, so that is a value. People wanted to get that like. So they attended such events to have such content. And, and yeah, and then China was insulated. All right. And uh, there's no running events like fun runs over there. And, and hence, there was a big tension of demand. I, I, I see the same thing as well. That's why I think the Chinese government is also well aware, which is why Hong Kong is the, is the vaccinator, regulator. I think Hashkey, you know, just announced today they have a, they are a, a top tier uh, Web3 VC. And today, I think they just launched the uh, Hashkey exchange uh, in Hong Kong. All right, I was supposed to be there, but I'm here with you guys. All right, so, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, Hong Kong has been vaccinated for control and to regulate because... The government is also very wise to know that they can't stop it, mm. right? They have to have some form of regulation to that for various political and financial economical reasons, right? To to maintain uh, stability, uh, I see that the same in China, and you know people have access to their mobile phones, to the internet. You know people can travel freely in China, right? It's not like forty years ago, right? People can travel in and out. They, they will sure be exposed to crypto. They will sure be exposed to various Web3 projects. They will sure be exposed to various uh, job opportunities. So, so definitely the demand will be there. And, and we see a rising unemployment rate in China for various reasons. All right? And a lot of them, a lot of Web3 projects are actually built by Chinese builders, developers back in China. Mm. Right? And that is fine. All right? As long as you don't touch cryptocurrency, in China borders, within China borders, it's fine. So, so definitely, I think there will be more ways, more innovation to have regulations that allow uh, people to be involved in the Web3 space uh, more effectively. Mm. So I think that is the, the shift and the trend. Uh, and we look at 1.4 billion population. Mm -hmm. All right, And of course, India is another 1.5 billion population. So, and tech savvy, both are tech savvy, Superpower. So this is going to drive uh, a lot of activity in this part of the world in Southeast Asia because Southeast Asia is relatively still quite free. Cost of living is is low, all right. Other than Singapore, <laughs> all right. But the rest of the world uh, in in this part of Southeast Asia is pretty relatively low and infrastructure already. All right. Thailand has got one of the highest five uh, G internet penetration in the world. All right, so you need that for your blockchain verifications. All right, so uh, I think uh, this part of the world is ready. Mm -hmm. And there's so many, you know, nice spots like Bali, Phuket, Pattaya that is so attractive for digital native because you don't have to work physically, all right, because all your other co-workers are somewhere around the world, different time zones. All right, so, I mean, you want to be somewhere that's conducive, relaxing, enjoying yourself, you know, other than working. All right, you come to Southeast Asia that is affordable and sustainable. So I think climate, environment, yeah, economic reasons, I think it's going to drive a, a big push to, to this part of the world, which is why we are strategically uh, advantaged and positioned on that. Great, yeah. And, and it's, um, I mean, the, <coughs> the arguments are, are clear, right, for, for uh, innovation in this part of the world. Also, if it, you know, going back to, I guess, the theme of culture and uh, the way that we see, if you look at the world of fashion, for example, where some of the really big fashion houses are entering Web3, uh, a lot of it feels like it has been inspired by some of uh, what we see coming out of China. So like, um, I think of a good example. Uh, I guess high fashion combined with pop culture, right, was something that would probably never have happened five years ago in Europe. But then we've seen it coming up over the past couple of years with, you know, the likes of Gucci really committing to the space. I think Dolce Cabana even did like a big, a big NFT thing, right? Uh, so that's also something I'm really interested in is the way that I guess pop, pop culture and traditional culture are coming together around Web three as well. Uh, are there any examples you that spring to mind for you thinking about kind of that, that kind of space? Yeah. So. One of the one of the brands that we worked with is Adidas last year, uh, and and we did it in a very local flavor. We had an expo. It's a small collection. Uh, it's for charity. So a hundred percent of the uh, revenue uh, goes to charity. So it's sponsored by 
Western Corp, all right, which is a local sports uh, retailer. Uh, they have the uh, rights to customize uh, the Adidas sneakers, uh, like the Singapore Airlines Batik design print, and uh, uh, they are promoting for limited edition. So they are the holding company of limited edition. And, you know, uh, yeah, we gathered tattoo artists, we gathered, you know, uh, cool people, all right, cool and young savvy people uh, in the fashion space. Uh, Because it's the kind of mindset, right? It's like frontier technology, blockchain, web tree, frontier. So the early adopters. So I think it's all about targeting the mindset. Like what I mentioned, right? It's all in the mind, right? So these are the adventurers, the explorers, the early adopters, the innovators, that I think the brands want to target. Because most of the time, these are leaders. They will lead the trend, right? There's a good chance that this trend can get viral. In any case, there's nothing much to lose anyway as well, all right? So it is a good experimentation. So I think a lot of brands are uh, taking the leap of faith for this experimentation. Of course, we, we do see a lot of pullback uh, with the crypto uh, winter and with some of the not so good news, all right, from uh, the big corporations that there was uh, uh, getting involved uh, in, in the negative news, all right. So, so I think there is some holdback. But at the end of the day, uh, corporate leaders, brand leaders, they will understand that, you know, it is not the technology or the cryptocurrency or an NFT uh, issue. They are just a medium. They are just a tool for anyone to use, all right? So it is the people behind it that is driving, whether it's a progressive one or a destructive one. Mm. So at the end of the day, I think uh, as business leaders, as entrepreneurs, I think a lot of them still will want to uh, take the risk, but they will want to be more careful and they want to understand how it works rather than just jumping on the bandwagon Mm. uh, without uh, thinking of the uh, deep and clear strategy. Yeah, it makes total sense. And I, I think for um, you know some of these really big brands, if you think you know Nike, uh, Adidas, uh, uh, those kind of brands, it allows them to kind of live out their brand promise without limitations as well, right? If it's about championing, ath- championing athletes or championing creators, or I guess in the case of Red Bull sports people, uh, as soon as you move into the digital world, there are no limitations. So, you know, a sneaker can become something completely different from a, an experiential perspective. Um, were you guys involved with the, the Heine Kicks? Yes. Yeah. So we, we hosted the event and we exhibited the, uh, the Heine Kicks. All right. It was one of the first few feature toes yeah. as well. Yeah. So it's part of the same uh, with Couch Cartel, with Western Corp. Yeah. So these are the partners that we had back in 2022. Yeah, nice. So the, if, in case uh, you haven't heard about these, uh, they're basically a, a, a sneaker designed sneaker. by uh, um, shoe, 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 shoe surgeon, surgeon, right? Shoe yeah. surgeon, yeah. And it's uh, Heineken silver themed and... It infused with beer. Right? Real <laughs> beer in the soul. Instead of air. Yeah. Beer. <laughs> Sounds yeah. disgusting, but yeah. I mean, they look really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It is, it is cool. It is cool. So it's, I think it's a great... Uh, a form of digital, right? Where you have a physical collectible. It is just for collectible, right? And you do have that digital representation. And one of the key uses, use cases for collectibles are for trading. Right? Among, it's, a, it's a form of, trading is not just about making profits or returns, right? There's a huge trading collectible industry out there. All right, you have your Nike stickers. It's not just about making the profits. A lot of them is for a form of communication and social as well, mm. right? To be able to interact and trade and socialize with fellow like-minded people that you know like to collect these collectibles. So it's not just about making money, mm. right? It's a, it's a it's a form of social credit. It's a form of a uh, sense of belonging. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then and where I think it gets really interesting is where you see these different kind of online communities or like. Uh, uh, expressions of brand like crossing over yeah, right exactly and there's no better or no other way that you can do it without digital mm. digitalizing mm. it right so because of that digital identity that digital asset it allows you to prove the providence that this is a real one it allows you to prove that you are the rightful owner it allows you to prove that you know whoever has owned it before or transacted it before so that is only you know possible with blockchain technology right there's no no other ways that you can uh 
uh, sort of validate that that providence of it. Did you, have you seen the uh, the collaboration between Doodles and Crocs? Yeah, I saw it. Yeah, it's all my Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> right. I just saw it this morning. Yeah, I just saw one. Yeah, I saw it and I was like, you know, I mean, I have never won a Croc in my life, right? But I have maybe never. I'm just Me too. <laughs> I, I I don't have a Croc as well. Yeah. yeah. If you're not seeing this, go check it out. It's like it's yeah. rainbow colored, uh, like doodle inspired rainbow colored Crocs, right? Mm. With different little kind of badges mm. on to represent different parts of the Doodles universe. I'm sure if you are. If you're into doodles or if you're like under the age of 40, <laughs> you might like them. Um, cool. Let's talk about the future a little bit. So, yeah. you know, we're, we're in a bear market now. But um, as you said, bear market is time for building. This is where you see who really has metal. Uh, it's where the resilient projects come through. Um, and any trends that are kind of picking up in the bear market, we could hypothesize we'll have a better chance. I think future, one tip. Right? And also encouragement to those that are still fighting or that are struggling to raise money or to build a team to, to launch a product to market. Mm. It's actually easier than bear market. To send out. I was in a bull market, all right. It's really hard to send out because the big boys, they will be throwing millions of dollars, hundreds of millions sometimes, all right. And there's no way that you can be seen. All right, digital agencies, publications, they will be charging at exorbitant rates. Because people are fighting for limited resources and limited attention. So this is a time where you can be able to build uh, good attention with the right audience. Because during the bull market, it's just too much noise, right? Just too much noise. And uh, this is a time where you can really build uh, your, a good following and stuff like that. So going into the future, definitely, as I mentioned, I think we all know about Bitcoin halving and it's all about you know belief, perception and everything law of attraction, uh, self-fulfilling prophecy. Whether is it a bull market or a bear market, it's all about sentiments. Whether is it in a traditional finance or in a blockchain, it's all about sentiments as well. All right. Uh, greed and fear, FOMO. All right. So, so these are the, some of the things that drives the, the market. So in terms of the macro, uh, definitely there will be a few key drivers. Whether is it the Bitcoin halving or is it new technology, or new traditional players or new regulations that enable mass adoption, all right, uh, I think that will definitely come in time. Whether is it six months, 12 months, 18 months, 24 months, all right, I, I, I wouldn't know. But I think uh, that will come. So that macro will bring along the next wave of mass adoption as well, like what we've seen in the last one. So the last one we've seen uh, millions of people got onboarded, right, like myself. All right. I although my first interaction with uh, cryptocurrency is 2016 in Shanghai, where Bobby Lee from BTCC gave me my first Bitcoin as a souvenir. Back then, one Bitcoin is only a thousand dollars. He gave you the card. He gave me the, just a token, right? It's like a casino token, a souvenir, yeah, yeah, and stuff yeah. like that. So cool. he's trying to get onboarding for his BTCC back then. So that was my first interaction, and uh, but seriously, only getting involved late 2021. And never regretted a single day because after, you know, locking myself up in the room for two weeks to really deep dive and learn, you know, really going deep and, and looking at the solidity contracts, how, how solidity contract being written, what are some security risks. So deep dive into that and then, boom, voila, all right, you don't need any education. I think 90% of the people in this Web3 space don't have specific degree or master's or PhD in blockchain none it all didn't right? exist. you don't need right so <laughs> you just have to have a very open mind a progressive mind willing to learn willing to try willing to experiment i think yeah you, you can master that that science and art and be an innovator in the space so i think we see that we already see that and it's very encouraging to see that there's still a lot of builders a lot of projects now deep in the bear market it is it is still a very optimistic future for sure. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to zero. If it's not going to zero, then where is it going to be? Yeah. And then where do you want to come in to learn and try or to experiment or to build? All right, we will, we will definitely, you know, have setbacks. All right, that is why having that resilience uh, mindset and that positive mindset to keep yourself going and, and keep your team going. Yeah. 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 And, and then, so if you think about kind of 
the next wave and the next wave of mainstream adoption. What do you see as the main driver for that? Is it is it something cultural? Is it something financial? Is it something else entirely? So it's always about demand and supply. All right. Uh, for from history, right? So it's always about demand and supply. So back in the last bull run that we saw in 2016-17 and then the crash happened, all right. Back then was a huge lack of use cases for the tokens. Right, that was launched in the IDOs. And one of the major ones that stood out from that was Ethereum. And Ethereum Foundation, I have full respect for them. They are continue building, you know, they have good builders as well. And they built ERC20, they built ERC721, and then 1155, and then a lot more protocols, right? Having that infrastructure, which drove the first use case, which is NFTs, having a PFP. So that drove, I think, uh, that was one of the key drivers. And then you have, with NFTs, you have like move to earn games and stuff like that, right? So digital assets can be exchanged for, for, for games. So that drove the the uh, uh, the last bull run. So same here, I mean, we look deep down, we did some soul searching as well, all right? When, when times are tough, we're like, what the hell are we building? Who are we building for? Why are we building? Is this even worth it, all right? You don't want to run around like a headless chicken, right? So. Although I've been changing many directions and my team are frustrated as well, all right? So, but we, we look deep and we see that there is a lack of real-world value and real-world value comes from real-world assets, real-world services. So I think that is our big bet on real-world assets and services. You know, how can digital assets be able to exchange you a bowl of chicken rice or plate of chicken rice, a bowl of noodles or pay for the rent? to fulfill your basic lifestyle needs or even have the investment vehicle. So we are, I mean, at Tomorrow Labs, we are, I mean, one, one of the biggest questions that people always ask me, like, how the hell do you get Heliconian Capital Automatic to invest in you pre-revenue, pre-product? <coughs> so I, I did a pitch to the leadership and I said that uh, Singapore economy is one of the top in the world, all right, GDP per capita. But 200 years ago, you're nothing. But going into the future, uh, we will never become a superpower because of our physical limitations, right? You, we just can't have 100 million people on this island, right? It's just, you know, physically it's not possible. But can this be possible digitally? Can we take you know, the best resources, the best things that we have built over the last 200 years from talented people around the world like you guys, right? There's strong talent acquisition programs, Right, to, to acquire the best talents around the world to be in Singapore, to working for the working with the Singapore economy, to grow the Singapore economy, strong capital uh, reserves, strong capital uh, uh, policies, financial policies. So these are the things that I'm learning and I'm duplicating it and designing it with Web3. So I think we, not Singapore, but you know, a unified you know, Southeast Asia economy can be very powerful and it's going to lead the, the rest of the world going into the future. And I think Web3 technology, blockchain technology is, is the enabler right, to allow us to live anywhere but connected by you know, that, that identity, by the technology, by the ownership, by the community of different interests and connecting through the brands, the brands from the region, like Chinese brands, Southeast Asia brands, Singapore brands, to be, con to be able to continue to serve uh, the people, yeah. So I think that is uh, that is the future that I see, like future of lifestyle, future of work. Super exciting. That's a, that's a future I want to be a part of for sure. For sure, Arthur, you mentioned kind of Ethereum's as an evolution and and the fact that uh, through the different tokens that Ethereum has now developed, there are a whole bunch of different use cases and experience that people are able to deploy on Ethereum. Um, in contrast to Bitcoin, which by many, not everybody, has been viewed as a, a kind of store of value and, and not much else. Uh, until this year where we saw ordinals take off. And this is a space that you're also involved with. Uh, so how do you see, well, first of all, maybe let's pull the lens back. Uh, what, are, what are ordinals and how do you see this space uh, playing out? So ordinals came about with the voting of uh, the Bitcoin community, uh, the Bitcoin miners, all right, that uh, they want to do this taproot grid exactly to, you know, 
uh, increase the use case. So basically, uh, I mean, without going to the details, right? You know, your your, your sets, right? Which is uh, one of the uh, smallest unit of the Bitcoin, all right? Has an index, right? Has an index of memory storage that they can be written to record data, and this index is able to help you withdraw data, all right? And and display it. So uh, that comes about all you know that you know your image or digital assets can be inscribed onto the Bitcoin chain uh, under this uh, protocol called BRC20, right? And then, of course, there are more BRC protocols coming out, or BRC721, so, so looking at duplicating many sort of uh, similar techniques from the ERC, or frameworks from the ERC. With that, I think uh, it evolves a lot of uh, interest and uh, innovation from uh, the uh, tech innovators, so they are building, you know, recursive technology that now you know you can uh, take data. Basically, you you can take data, all right, in multiple sources simultaneously. So you can form a picture with data that is stored in different places. In the past, it's just one validation at a time, all right. So that's BRC twenty, all right. So, but now you can through recursive, you can form. Uh, a library. So with this uh, library being formed, all right, you can mix and match. So it's pretty much like a generative art. All right. So that will allow much faster validation, right, at a much uh, uh, lower gas fee, and you had you can do even more an uh, intricate uh, details to to your uh, art, because each of these art hold a certain uh, amount of memory. So with this now distributed. And assembled, all right, through this uh, uh, Bitcoin protocol, right, through the uh, recursive protocol, uh, you are able to make more intricate and uh, more detailed uh, digital assets, yeah, artistic assets on the on the Bitcoin. But I think Ordinals technology itself, Bitcoin technology, is still at a very early stage. All right, so it's still at a very early stage. It's only it's less than a year old. All right, from the upgrade, and we saw a huge adoption. All right, and I think people are venturing this space now because they do want to continue to build uh, better solutions, more solutions for mass adoption, and and that will come with rewards. All right, so I mean we all need to put food to the table, we all need to pay bills, right? So you need to be early to be able to reap the rewards. So I think a lot of uh, experimenters are, are doing that, and for us strategically, because we build on uh, Bitcoin or, or we. we you know, build ordinals or create ordinals because it's not built. It's the most decentralized form of uh, blockchain proof of work. There's no one or institution behind it. All right, it's gonna be there perpetually. Twenty one million bitcoins are gonna be there. It's gonna be validating mining. All right, it's gonna this this protocol is just gonna be perpetual. Uh, unlike any other blockchain out there, none. There's none. Right, other than uh, Bitcoin, there's no other. Uh, that is fully decentralized. So we build on something that is most fun, most foundation and fundamental, uh, where we are building something that is sustainable for the future. That is why we are building uh, and launching Arduino. So I think there is a a lot of opportunity to build solutions uh, on the honors and we want to brand ourselves as one of the key innovators uh, to be able to bring in real world assets, right? Stable real world assets like real estate uh, into the space, and then you know helping brands to fundraise and, and uh, expand their resources. Yeah. Cool. Well, listen, Arthur, I could sit here and talk with you uh, and listen to your perspectives for a good while longer. Uh, but let's, uh, I'm conscious we do have to wrap things up. Uh, so I just wanted to say a really big thank you to you for coming on today. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been great to talk with you. And uh, I'm sure that everybody tuning in has learned a, a whole lot from you uh, when it comes to um, not only, I guess, Web3 culture and its impact on society and brands, but also uh, really thinking to the future and, and about how things are going to evolve as we move out of this, uh, this bear market and into the next cycle. Um, before we do wrap things up, uh, you uh, have just had a really big launch. Uh, so I think it'd be great if you could uh, share with folks at home where they can uh, go and interact with Giants Planet and, uh, and learn a little bit more. And then maybe also um, if you could share a little bit about where people can find you online uh, if they want to hear more from you. 
Yep. So my Twitter handle is uh, Arthur Lin SG. So very simple. And um, my project is giantsplanet.com. Uh, we want to build an economy that empower people to be able to work and live freely anywhere in the world. So we are building that digital economy for the digital nomads to build that digital um, kind of uh, economy and ecosystem for Web3 population. Super cool. Yeah. Very cool. I mean, that is uh, that is truly digital, yeah. right? <laughs> and allowing people to have a stake in the business so they will have like, we will have tokenized. Uh, so having this Ordinos or this BRC20 tokens that we'll have will allow you to pay for your rent. We allow you to, you know, have a stake in a real estate asset that will be converted into a co-living space. And we'll also give you a stake in the company that potentially be an IPO company. That's why the ordinance will give you pre-IPO allocation of Tomorrow Labs, our company, where we are positioned to be a, a listed company in the uh, next 12 to 24 months. Amazing. That's some real alpha yeah. right here giantplanets.com go check it out yep. Arthur it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on today thanks thank so you. much for joining thank you so much. Um, thank you if you enjoyed today's uh, content and you'd like to see more where this came from uh, then please go and like and su subscribe um, our YouTube channel and thanks again for joining and we'll look forward to the next episode